Yeah, that's usually about when we start is when we eclipse the 40 person mark. Okay, we're there. Okay, welcome everybody to today's colloquium. Our speaker today is Ben Brown from University of Colorado. Uh, ben is a very vivacious speaker, so it should be a fun time. Uh, ben uh, actually did his PhD just a few miles down the road at Harvey Mudd. Sorry, that's his bachelor's. PhD at Colorado with Yuri Toomery. Uh, postdoc, I met him at KITP uh, when he was there as a postdoc. We did some, wrote a paper together, I think. We uh, did. Now, you wrote a paper, which I got to hang out on. So, <laughs> And I just checked, it's still the first paper on your website, which apparently has not been updated since 2014. <laughs> yeah. Um, but yeah, Ben does a lot of fun stuff, uh, largely focused on you know big numerical simulations of things like convection and magnetic dynamos. But one of the things I really enjoy about Ben is he he tries to boil all that down and interpret it in terms of things like ratios of relevant dimensionless numbers so that we actually learn something from it. And another thing that Ben does really well is um, developing open source code. So he's one of the developers of the Daedalus code, which is an open source MHD code, which I think is rapidly becoming one of the more widely used codes in, in astrophysics and other fields as well. So Ben's got a lot of good stuff in store for us today. So take it away, Ben. All right, thank you, Jim. And um, thank you everyone for coming today. And I, I hope you enjoy a little tour through some things about um, stellar dynamos and um, cool problems in the sun and ways we might learn about the sun from stars and other cool things. Um, I like fluid dynamics and I like fluid dynamics of stars. So let's have some fun. Um, I won't be able to see any of you while I'm giving the talk because keynote hides all of the Zoom gallery, um, but I am, I, I will, uh, I'll, I'll be right here as you'll see me. Um, so, okay, so today um, our, our title of our talk is Approaching the Solar Dynamo from Unusual Angles, um, M-Dwarf Stars, Polar Views, and Different Dynamo Mechanisms. Um, if I stay the task, we'll get to all of those. Um, uh, a lot of the work I'm gonna show you here today is work that was done both by myself and, and my friends and colleagues in the Daedalus collaboration, which are these names in gray in the middle, me at University of Colorado, Jeffrey Oishi at Bates College, Jeffrey Vassell at University of Sydney, Daniel Lecone at Northwestern and Keaton Burns at MIT. Um, and I've got a picture in the background here of some unusual findings from global dynamo simulations of indoor stars, which will come and meet in a moment. Um, but I wanna take a moment before I, I get excited about science and things like that to show you some of the people who've been involved in this larger set of work that I'm gonna be showing today. Um, portions of it are my own, um, but portions of it were done by students and postdocs um, who worked with me or with the Core Daedalus collaboration team. Um, so I am standing in front of you today and speaking to you right now and I am a particular person and I will use we a lot when I'm speaking, when I say we, it means all of these people in different ways. Um, when I say I, those are probably things I'm directly responsible for. So here's kind of a, a picture of some of the people who are currently working on this or worked on in the past. Um, uh, the Daedalus collaboration is pictures of us all from about seven years ago when we were younger at KATP and we are black and white. Um, young, vibrant people get to have color pictures. So, all right. Let's go inside of our sun for a moment. Our sun has mysteries on large scales. Um, I, at the left is a, this uh, pink cartoon is sort of a cartoon structure of the sun. Um, the center of the sun is a region of nuclear fusion. Um, energy is carried outwards by photons for roughly the inner two thirds of the sun, making what we call the stably stratified radiative zone of the sun. And then in the outer third of the sun, the, the star becomes too cold and, um, and opaque for the photons to get through easily. And so it starts to drive convectively unstable motions. And roughly the outer third of the sun is a shell of, um, of convective motions churning along. We can see a little bit for the inside of the sun beyond cartoons. We have the lovely science of helioseismology that lets us use sound waves observed at the surface of the sun to infer the properties of the interior. And one of the first things that you can observe really well in the sun 
is what is called the differential rotation profile of the sun. Um, our star is a very odd object. The equator rotates faster than the poles in an angular sense. The equator goes around once every roughly 25 days. The poles go around once every roughly 35 days. And there's a huge shear and latitude in between the equator and pole. And that is the rainbow of color in the rightmost diagram. Red is fast, blue is slow. Um, the, the difference rotation of the sun extends throughout the convection zone. So the redness goes from the surface, which is this black line here on the right, down to the dashed line, which is the base of the convection zone. Um, there, the pattern extends to the North Pole, sort of consistently through the convection zone. And then weird things happen when you get to the radiative zone. In the radiative zone, the sun suddenly like, hey, I'm going to be normal, and I'm going to spin like a solid body. So all of the radiative zone is yellow. It all rotates at the same rate. Um, there's a, a, a shear layer in between the two called the tachycline. Um, there's another shear layer near the surface called the NSSL, the near surface shear layer. And some of the big questions for the inside of the sun that pop out just immediately on looking at this are things like, well, why does the interior of the sun rotate like it does? Why do we have a different rotation in the convection zone? Um, we have some ideas about that. Um, we thought we had clear answers, and then we found out that those answers weren't really quite correct. Um, that was actually a huge triumph of science. I'll show you a little bit of that today. Uh, another kind of interesting thing, um, the near surface shear layer of the sun uh, actually ends up being unstable to the magnetorotational instability. Um, that's interesting. What's that mean? Um, and kind of the bigger kind of er question of all of this is where are the global scale magnetic fields of the sun built? Um, are they built uh, at the base of the convection zone in the tachycline? Um, that was a very popular theory in solar communities for going on 30 or 40 years. Um, are they maybe built in the bulk of the convection zone? That's, a, that's an idea that's gotten some currency in the last decade or so. Um, I did some work that, that triggered some thoughts for that. Um, or could they even be like built and organized maybe just up in the surface layer, which is where we actually see all the dynamics happening anyways? Um, and we'll, we'll learn a little bit about that today. Um, there's another really big mystery in the sun that I want to show you briefly, um, which is in the cartoon picture at the left, um, where it's showing the convection zone, um, we've drawn some squiggly lines that show sort of classic scales of convection. And the convective instability when it happens, whether it happens in rayleigh bernard Boussinesque, like Cartesian domains, or whether it happens in stratified rotating shells, um, convection often likes to assume order one aspect ratio in, in the motions that it does. So we see that near the surface. We see, um, we see granulation driven by, by photon losses at the radiative boundary layer. Um, this creates a thousand kilometer, megameter convective cells that bubble away about every five minutes and churn continuously. We see those really beautifully. Um, we see another scale of motion called the super granules, which are about 30 of these little blobs, 30,000 kilometers. From everything that we know about fluid dynamics, there should be a scale of motion that we call giant cells, which goes basically from the base of the convection zone to the surface of the star. And so they're about a third of a solar radius in height. And so they should be like a third of a solar radius in horizontal extent if they're an order one aspect ratio cell. It means they're like 100 megameters, 100,000 kilometers or bigger on the surface of the sun. Um, they also should have just absolutely massive amplitudes. Okay, um, we've tried to go look for them. Um, we've tried very hard using helioseismology, using a version of helioseismology called local helioseismology. And the two major communities of this um, cannot agree on what they see. Um, helioseismology is an inversion problem. Um, I've talked to some of you today about inversion problems. Inversion problems are very hard. Um, and they use two different inversion techniques. One's called the ring diagram community, one's called the time distance community. And in 2012, the, the time distance community published a, a very striking result. Uh, Shravan Hanasoje and uh, a bunch of other very good helioseismologists came out and said, we tried to find motions in the interior of the sun on the scale of giant cells and we can't find them. 
And the upper limit that we can put on them is a meter per second in flow amplitude or smaller. There's nothing there. That's an upper limit. Okay. In, uh, in 2015, uh, Ben Greer and a team out of Colorado doing ring diagram helioseismology came and said, we found them, firm detection. The red line here is their firm detection with error bars. And it's like 100 meters a second. Okay. It's two orders of magnitude difference in the observational constraint here. And um, both of these observations actually use the same data. Both observations come from the Solar Dynamics Observatory, our best satellite for observing geoseismology on the sun. So there's a huge gap in our knowledge of motions in the interior of the sun on the largest scales. Um, even, even the firm detection, the red lines here, there's a green and purple line up here that are some simulations. And you might look at those and say, hey, those are pretty close. Um, and they're close-ish. But from a fluid dynamics perspective, the difference between this red line and the simulated lines um, completely changes the fluid dynamics regime that your simulations would be in compared to the sun, and in particular, the rotational constraint. And I'm going to tell you a little bit of a story about that today, the Rossby number of the sun. So there are mysteries in the sun. Um, we don't know why the inside of the sun has the, um, the dynamical structures it has. We don't know what the convection inside the sun is doing, and we don't know where the dynamo in the sun even operates and lives. Okay, so what are some things we can learn? How can we, how can we start peeling apart some of these problems? Um, before, before I get to what we can do to answer this, I want to give you a little history of our knowledge of the solar dynamo. Um, it's going to be sort of a quick traverse through history, basically of the last 20 years. Um, uh, to give you a little bit of an idea of why we think we can do some things now and why new observations are a, a keenly necessary constraint. Um, first of all, you may have heard a little bit about solar dynamo modeling, and you may have heard words like mean field models or alpha omega dynamos or things like that. And in the dynamo, in sort of the dynamo research field, there basically are two fundamental approaches to studying dynamos. I'm going very fast and loose here, but very broadly speaking, out of a cartoon view, there's the, um, the mean field modeling approach. So these are typically two-dimensional models. Um, in a mean field model, you have highly parameterized physics. So you say something like, well, there's convection. I don't know what it does. So I'm going to treat it with some sort of turbulent closure. And I'm going to make some choices about how convection interacts with magnetic fields. And I'm going to come up with something like an alpha effect. And I'm going to try and motivate that by some physics. And then I'm going to see what that does. And the different closure models you choose give you different named kinds of dynamos. So they're like alpha omega dynamos. They're alpha squared dynamos. They're interface dynamos. They're flux transport dynamos. There are many variants. Um, these are computationally inexpensive. Um, you, can, you can often run them on a fairly small scale machine, which also means you can run thousands of them simultaneously. Um, you can run them for a long time, so you can simulate many cycles, you can try many ideas, and they are an absolutely crucial tool for us as a technological society, because these are the tool you would have to use to try and make predictions about future solar cycles and whether or not we should worry about things like solar storms impacting the power grid and if we need to change our power grid. So they're a critical tool. Um, we're, in, uh, we're in cycle 25 now. Um, we've gone all the way through what's called cycle 24. It's a sunspot cycle. And in um, an interesting exercise was done kind of in the early phase of cycle 24 in 2012. A series of these mean field models made predictions of how big the cycle would be based on sunspots at the surface of the sun. And these are shown in the histogram at the upper right. And um, two models, D1 and D2, predicted uh, small bars, small numbers of sunspots. And models D3 and D4 predicted large bars, large numbers of sunspots. Um, this was published in 2012. It was a prediction. Um, the cycle peaked a number of years later. And I put a purple band about where the actual peak of the cycle was. And we could look at this and we could say, hey, this is great. Um, we can do science. We can do some hypothesis testing, we can, um, we can reject models D3 and D4. They clearly fail the test. Uh, D1 and D2 seem like they're reasonable. Um, let's get rid of D3 and D4. Let's proceed with D1 and D2 and let's like, let's move on. Let's, let's make some progress. I've highlighted D1 and D4 because the problem is that D1 and D4 are the same model 
with minor changes to the parameters that you think shouldn't matter. And they give completely different answers. And that's, um, that's a problem. That means that these models are very sensitive to the parameters that we don't know. Okay, what's our other approach? Um, our other approach is the, the 3D modeling community. So here you're gonna use big computers and parallel codes and do a really computationally expensive thing and try and simulate something like MHD convection in a stratified rotating sphere. Um, the good things is that the, the stuff that comes up in the model largely emerges from first principles. So interactions between the convection and rotation lead to the building of a global scale differential rotation and maybe global scale magnetic fields. Um, so you kind of, you, you're able to do an experiment that self consistently builds its own things. Um, those have gotten to the spot where we can simulate them well enough for about a decade now that you could actually get coherent organized magnetic fields and cycles of magnetic polarity. A movie from one of these is playing at the right and a, um, a, a map, a time and space map of magnetic fields is shown at middle. Um, and we're in a spot where they're like fairly easy to achieve these, at least at low resolution. And um, so they're, they're a good set of experiments. Their problems, their drawbacks are that they are not models of the sun. And solar parameters are well out of reach. And these are so computationally expensive that it's hard to move towards so the solar parameters. And it's hard to even know kind of what you're getting wrong. But they're at least something where we can do physical experiments and learn from them. Okay. Okay. Um, why is the sun hard to simulate? Um, when we think about the sun as a fluid dynamical object, um, almost all of the parameters of the sun are either 10 to the big or 10 to the small. Um, so the Reynolds number of the sun is like 10 to the 15. And so that tells you something about how turbulent the object is and the separation and scales in the sun between like the smallest dynamical scale and the largest dynamical scale probably goes as like the three quarters scale of that Reynolds number, which means it's like, I think say 10 to the 12 in scale separation. And a really good simulation right now is 10 to the three in scale separation. So we're, we're a little far away from the actual parameters of the sun. Um, this is true for other parameters too, like the diffusion coefficients and all sorts of other things. Um, the one really interesting thing about the sun is that the Rossby number of the sun, the ratio of the time scale of convection to the time scale of rotation, it's not well known, but it's believed to be of order one or maybe small-ish, but probably like 0.1. And that is in a range of non-dimensional parameters that we can do experiments and studies of in some very meaningful ways. And that's leading to some very new views about the interior of the sun. Okay. How long have we been studying the sun? What's our, what's our kind of dynamical history of the sun? Well, the first 3D spherical global dynamo models of the sun that got like magnetic fields and other stuff like that were done in the 1980s. Um, Peter Gilman, Gary Glatzmeier, um, 1980s for sort of Boussinesque stuff. Um, by 1985, they had pretty solid stratified analastic dynamos. The resolutions were low, the dynamics were limited, their differential rotation was kind of solar-like. Um, I'm going to show some images in some of these. The solar actual observed differential rotations, this beautiful um, half hemisphere rainbow. And in black and white, because it was the 1980s, is their plot from their paper of their differential rotation, showing contrast of it. Okay. So they did like the best they could do in the mid 1980s. Uh, that was the max of computational power, and they were kind of stuck. All right. Things in solar dynamo simulations kind of froze out. It was waiting for computers to catch up in a real way. And in this particular case, it took basically until the early 2000s. Um, in the early 2000s, um, led in large part by Yuri Tumre, who is here at CU Boulder, there was a real rebuilding of these analastic spherical dynamo codes for modern computers. Um, this led to a mob called the ASH mob, the analastic spherical harmonic mob. Um, many of us, when we were much younger, show up in this picture. So some of you may know, for example, Matthew Browning, who's at University of Exeter. Um, Matthew Browning is standing in the back here. Um, some of you may know uh, uh, Sasha Brun of CEA Saclay. Um, this is Sasha Brun right here, well-dressed um, as a Parisian. Um, Yuri Tumre is wearing the bunny ears right here. And I am actually holding the bear right here. Uh, back when I had much shorter hair, much less gray hair and no beard. 
Um, and this is Mark DeRosa in the solar community, who's at Lockheed Martin, um, Air and Space Lab, uh, Kyle Augustin, who's very active in stellar dynamo work, and Nick Featherstone, who's a real leader in solar dynamo work. Okay. So in about the 2000s, the advances in computing hardware um, let us do a whole new class of models and simulation. And this really unlocked kind of a, a, a brief flowering and golden era of solar dynamo simulations on global scales. Um, the very first dynamo results were really realized with that tool in about 2004. Um, there was a lot of work to like really tune in the solar differential rotation profile by really understanding subtle thermal wind effects by uh, Mark Misch, following work by Matthias Rempel. And um, so like here's, here's where they got to um, in 2006. And the picture in E here in rainbows looks really similar to the solar differential rotation profile. It was, it was this great victory. Um, Rotate, resolutions are middling. Time evolution we could achieve was longish, but like still like not super great. Um, things looked really good. Okay. So um, computers got bigger. Um, bigger computers meant bigger simulations. Um, the simulation I was showing you a few minutes ago is sort of 100 cube scale. This is a simulation at 1,000 cube scale. This was a Hero calculation by Mark Misch in 2008. Um, it, took, it took essentially a year to run on the biggest supercomputers at the time. It was millions of CPU hours at the time. Uh, you can now run the simulation in about a week or maybe two, um, which is a very good thing. Um, at this time, you could only run one of these and you couldn't run it for very long. And things seemed fine, sort of. Um, the, the, the convective patterns are just beautiful. Uh, the different rotations shown here, and it's kind of got the right sense. I mean, it's still red at the equator, it's still blue at the poles, but it's gotten really grotty. And the previously we had like quantitative direct ma matches, and now like we're getting kind of like a much weaker match. And that's that's the first signal that things are going wrong. Um, here's kind of what the dynamics look like in this thing. And we'll actually come back to this because this simulation is profoundly wrong, but it can still teach us an awful lot about what to go looking for in the sun and how to learn more about these. And so it, it has remained an incredibly powerful um, art piece for inspiring thought and design. And it in fact is inspiring some real observations from an upcoming satellite mission. Okay, 2008. Um, at the same time was happening, things in the sun seemed just fine. And so a bunch of, at the time, grad students started studying lots of other stars. So like Matt Browning at this point did a bunch of A stars and M dwarfs. Um, I was playing with rapidly rotating solar type stars and lots of us who, who came through either Sasha Brun or Yuri Tumre kind of went out into the field. It was a bit of an industry. We learned some things, some of them still hold true. Um, and you know, on the HR diagram, we would do different stars in different spots. And we were very excited about this. And we, you know, we had M dwarfs that were near the fully convective limit. We had um, solar type stars, we had K stars, we had F type stars. We were kind of looking all over the lower main sequence. And here's a younger me at a meeting that Jim might well have been at actually as part of the, the TCAN spider. Um, we had a theoretical computational astrophysical network that Lars Bildston led. And I'm waving my arms and Matteo Contiello is taking a photo of me and we're up in San Luis Obispo. And we thought we really had things pinned down. 2013, okay. Um, one very interesting thing that we learned in this time is um, we started looking at the differential rotation and other types of stars. Um, and we started seeing some very interesting things. So if you look at the G stars through the K stars and even down to the M type stars, um, the differential rotation that we realize in a, um, in a model based on a stellar structure underneath it and, um, and convection at sort of the resolutions we could run at, the differential rotation profiles in different kinds of stars looks very similar. And so here are pictures of G stars to a fully convective M star. The M star has got a different color table because the M star was simulated about two years ago, whereas the other things were simulated about a decade ago. 
um, color tables evolve over time, maybe our great progress in science from the simulation perspective. That's a joke, but only kind of. When you take these, you can see some things that emerge, right? They've all got very similar profiles. They've got red at the equator, they've got blue at the poles. Um, if you measure them, there are quantitative agreements and we can collapse them on shared curves by using a non-dimensional Rossby number that we measure inside the simulations and comparing it to say a non-dimensional shear budget in the latitudinal differential rotation. And um, if, we, if we look at them, the stars that rotate rapidly are on the left. The stars that are kind of in the solar regime of Rossby number one are on the right. There's kind of a local maximum in the models at least. And, and there are a lot of things we can learn. And we can even see the stuff in fully convective stars, um, though here to get to these long Rossby numbers, you're talking stars with the rotation periods of hundreds of days. Okay. Um, the, one of the real triumphs of this was the, um, in all of these kinds of stars that have these strong differential rotations, the dynamo models of them build strong global scale magnetic fields and fields undergo regular changes in magnetic polarity. The spaghetti diagram here is magnetic fields traced through a solar type star simulation. The colors give you the polarity of the sunspot like fields, the east west fields. And generally, you start like in this movie from a state where it's blue in the south and red in the north. And as dynamics unfolds and the convection does its stuff, the blue in the south migrates towards the south pole, gets replaced by a large coherent red structure. And we flipped our sense and we now have red in the south and blue in the north. And so that was, that was sort of a huge thing. Okay, um, we learned some other things. Um, we, we sort of found extreme things at very low Rossby numbers um, that might have to do with the rotation activity correlation and saturation regimes. And there's some very interesting questions that came out of it. Um, what is the Rossby number of the sun? Um, many of these didn't rely on that shear boundary layer, um, what happens if you actually get rid of it? Um, the tachycline, if the tachycline is not important, is the other shear layer doing something? And the really profound question that started kind of keeping us up late at night is a question of what are we modeling in the first place here? Because we said we're modeling the sun, but what are we modeling? And one of the things that really sort of jumped out at me at one point was looking at a suite of models of stars ranging from F-type stars down to K-type stars. And I've selected carefully some random samples out of some F-stars, G-stars, and K-stars here. And um, these are convective patterns out of numerical simulations done with the ASH code using stellar structures from BESA or the French CZAM group. And if I cover up the color bars that give me the amplitude of the motions here, I can't tell any of these apart which tells me it's something profound. It tells me either that all stars are self-similar and behave very similar to each other and that we can learn something very profound about F stars by considering the sun and K stars and that there's this like beautiful underpinning of physics to all of it. Or it tells me that our numerical simulations are all self-similar to each other and have nothing to do with stars. And that is, the, that is sort of the crux problem to try and figure out. Um, I have some real hopes that the simulations are self-similar and stars are self-similar. And I think we're getting to a spot where we can answer some of these things. Um, but we got, we had some things that worried us and we got lucky as a community. Um, we had a problem that emerged in our simulations that was too big for us to ignore. And the problem that emerged in our numerical simulations of the sun, well, we always wanted to go more turbulent and we wanted to go to, to more resolution and, um, when we did that, something very peculiar happened. Um, we would put in the dimensional parameters of the sun. We put in the solar mass, the solar radius, the solar luminosity. And we'd crank down these niggling diffusion coefficients that shouldn't matter all that much. And we started getting a class of simulations that were rotating at the solar rate, but that had a differential rotation profile that was the opposite of what we observed in the sun. They went backwards. We call this now generally the problem of anti-solar differential rotation. It's been widely observed. Uh, the first times we started seeing it was in around 2007, 2008. We spent a very long time being confused about it. The, the thing that happens is that, so our rainbow diagram on the right now, so this is showing our, our difference rotation of the sun. The correct pattern for the sun is down in the lower ref. 
We should be red at the equator. We should be blue at the poles. We should have a fast equator. We have all sorts of stories about why that happens. And here instead, we have the exact opposite. We have a blue equator. We have red poles. We have very rapidly rotating poles. And we see that both in the averages and also in the actual convective patterns. The thing spins the wrong way for its self-realized differential rotation. We have some understandings of why that is now, um, but it was perplexing for a very long time. And it was a very robust result. Um, here's a parameter space map of the um, diffusion coefficients that we don't care about. Um, the solar-like things are up and to the right. The anti-solar things are the pink simulations down and to the left. The axes here are the um, viscous diffusion and the thermal diffusion. We're doing global simulations, so they have values of like 10 to the 12. The appropriate value of the viscous diffusion in the sun is somewhat smaller. It's about 10 um, based on plasma, uh, plasma diffusivities. And so, you know, it's 10 orders of magnitude down and to the left, which seems to be right in the regime we're seeing this. And I, I want to make a really clear point here, which is we learned we had a huge problem here. And we got really lucky as a solar dynamo modeling community. We had an order one disagreement with our major observational constraint when we did models in the direction that we thought we should be going. And that's really good because you can't just sweep a disagreement this big under the rug. Like this is something you really have to grapple with and try and understand. And our fundamental problem is that we thought we were simulating the sun by putting in the solar luminosity, the solar mass, the solar radius, the solar rotation rate and using a solar structure model. And we weren't because we got the non-dimensional parameters wrong. And that turns out to be far more important than getting the dimensional parameters right. And that's taken a lot of work to kind of wrap our heads around and think about. Okay, so, so what can we do? Um, simulations are kind of a thing unto themselves. Um, we get in trouble when we try and do a simulation of an astrophysical object in my, in my thinking and experience. Um, but that doesn't make them useless. Um, and in particular, at their best, simulations give us a place where we can test our ideas. Um, they can make us stop and think, and they can suggest new experiments to do or new ways that things might work. So now we're gonna, we've, we've gone through sort of the history, and now we're gonna go into like the hope for the future and sort of things we've learned. Um, we spent a while um, not really knowing what to do with global simulations. And so um, for my research group, what we decided to do was to do simulations that studied really fundamental physics that are the building blocks for global simulations. Um, so this is, this is a bunch of work that especially grad students and postdocs with me did. Um, Evan Anders, who's now at Northwestern as a Sierra fellow, did some really beautiful work on heat transport, asking questions about how stratified convection moves heat. Um, surprisingly, it moves heat almost exactly like the simple analog of Rayleigh Bernard that I teach in grad fluids and I'm teaching right now. Um, Jet Boardwell, who did some fantastic work on disequilibrium, oh, sorry, running out of words, disequilibrium chemistry. How does convection mix chemicals if the chemicals are undergoing fast reactions? Um, found a really nice model to uh, basically replace mixing length theory. Left the field shortly afterwards for a fantastic career as a data scientist in a, in a women's health um, cancer company in the Bay Area and did just beautiful work before leaving the field. Um, we learned a bit about rotating convection and we learned a lot for these systems like convection about the importance of capturing not just short time scale dynamics but also long time scale dynamics. How do you do thermal evolution? How do you capture the outer time scale without just like simulating every step along the way? Um, Evan, Evan and some others figured out some very clever ways to accelerate the evolution based on the turbulence statistics of a simulation, basically to simulate, guess the future, jump to the future and simulate again and do an iterative process. Um, we did some fun null tests too. Um, there's, a, there's a crazy idea in solar physics called entropy rain that basically says that plumes fall from the photosphere at the surface of the sun and fall all the way through the entire interior of the sun to the base of the convection zone. Um, Axel Brandenburg really wrote about that a lot. Um, we did some simulations of that and tried really hard to roll it out and found out we couldn't roll it out. So we focused on those things for a while. 
And we focused on that in part until we could figure out what questions needed to be answered to make global simulations meaningful. And I think we've really pinned one down and I'm gonna tell you about it a little bit. Um, one, one thing I would posit is that it's not terribly meaningful to go do a bunch of global simulations of the solar dynamo right now until we have some idea of where those simulations should be in the non-dimensional parameter space. We've got some ways to get to that from theory and we have an idea of a way you could get at it from observations where you could actually observe the dynamical regime that the sun is in. Um, and I think that to do this, we have to go to the pole of the sun because I think that at the pole of the sun, we could find giant cells of convection. The ones that we can observe at the equator, we might be able to see at the pole. I'm gonna tell you a little bit about this. Um, some of this feeds into some efforts from the Southwest Research Institute um, Nick Featherstone's been a big part of this, Brad Hinman, Derek Lamb. Um, and these are some ideas that have been very important in a mission that's currently in the middle of mission design called Solaris that may go and actually observe the solar poles. Okay, so what do we know about solar convection? Well, we know that flows at the surface that we can observe really well. So here are some, um, some observations from the Daniel K. Inouye Solar Telescope, our best solar telescope for observing the small scale motions on the sun. Um, the flows at the surface of the sun are small scale and they happen very quickly, once every five minutes. And so they're not rotationally constrained. They don't know anything about rotation of the sun. The sun rotates once every 30 days, roughly. These live and die every five minutes. Five minutes is much smaller than 30 days. These don't know anything about rotation. So they are blobs that emerge and fall. They, um, they have bright centers that are hot. They have dark edges that are cold. The edges flow down, the centers come up. We know a lot about this kind of convection. The radiative dynamics makes it a little more complicated, but not terribly. What's missing from that, and what matters for the deep interior, is rotation. So in the deep interior of the sun, Rotation starts to matter because the time scales of motion all slow down. And so eventually there's going to be a point in the interior where the flow time scales are slow compared to the rotation time scales. And rotation leads to really fundamental changes in fluid dynamics and convection. Um, in particular, if, if the rotation vector is pointing this way, if this, is, if this is the way that our North Pole is aligned, then my convective motions are going to tend to align in columns along that rotation axis. And we go from kind of blob structures to swirling columnar structures. Um, and we go from spreading centers to vortical structures that swirl around. Okay, we did some simulations of this. Um, this is something that's been deeply studied in the geophysical fluid dynamics community because the earth in its core is also very rapidly rotating. So there's a lot of work to try and understand rotation, convection interactions. All right. Um, the importance for rotation comes up in, in some, some surprising ways. Um, there's, there's been some very good new work um, by Jeff Fassel, Keith Julian, and Nick Featherstone, who are some excellent fluid dynamicists and solar physicists um, trying to come up with new mixing length-like approaches to describing convection from a stellar structure model that properly incorporate rotation into the mixing length transport. It turns out the, the rotation itself can change the transport that happens within, um, within a convection zone. And um, so here are some calculations by them. Um, uh, we're looking in a one-dimensional model of the sun we're looking from the base of the solar convection zone here, 0.7 solar radii up to about the surface. Um, and the dash, the black dash line is a classic MLT model. And the, um, the colored lines are their model that, that incorporates rotation from first principles. Um, this was published uh, early last year in PNAS and it's a lovely short piece that's well worth reading. It's sort of letter length and it's, it's really good. It's very clear, I think. Um, okay, the, um, the Rossby number you predict for mixing length um, ends up being sort of order one, that's the dashed line here. The Rossby number you predict from their theory is also sort of order one, it's actually a little bigger 
than you'd predict from the, um, the mixing length alone. Um, where things get very interesting is the spatial scales are different. That's this bottom plot. For mixing length theory, you expect that the only scale that should matter in the interior of the sun is like the density scale height. And that's this black dashed line here, which means that um, convective scales at the bottom of the convection zone are like 100 megameters in scale. They're very big because the density scale height there is very tall. And the convective scales get smaller and smaller and smaller as you come up towards the surface as the density scale height gets smaller. When you do the rotating theory, you get this red line and you predict that actually the convective scales should be almost the same everywhere in the convection zone. And this reflects the columnar nature of the convective motions that they're, they're feeling a different set of physics than the density stratification alone. The scale that is chosen here is fascinating. Um, Self-consistently out of the theory, the scale that comes out is 30 megameters. That's a fair bit smaller than 100 megameters. And it matches on to another pattern that we do see, which is the supergranulation at the surface of the sun. Now, I'm not saying that the supergranules at the surface of the sun are the giant cells of convection, but I'm saying that the giant cells of convection might be hiding underneath the supergranules at the surface of the sun. We have some reasons for thinking the supergranules are driven by maybe magnetic network organization at the surface of the sun. Okay, they're a spreading diverging flow. And it is quite possible that the correct picture for dynamics in the deep interior of the sun does not look like our non-rotating cartoon on the left, which is how we have thought of it before, very large sweeping motions, but maybe more like the right tight columnar motions that swirl and are aligned with the rotation axis and that are maybe not giant, but like on the same scale as the surface noise, the diverging flow of supergranules that's hiding them. Okay, so, so what do you do? Um, it's really, really hard to go looking for them at the equator for a variety of reasons. Um, one is that you may be looking at the edge of a swirling column and the signature may be pretty weak. Um, so we haven't found giant cells when we've been looking. Um, where are they? Rotation, as I hope I've just convinced you, leads to some surprising things. It leads to scale changes, and it leads to alignment with the rotation axis. It can also lead to different dynamics in a special region called the tangent cylinder, which is sort of those regions poleward of where the base of the convection zone at the bottom of the solar convection zone would like hit the rotation axis of the sun and project a shadow upwards. Okay. Um, there's another problem with the equatorial region of the sun. Um, the sun rotates every 30 days, which means if you're looking at the sun, this, any particular point on the surface of the sun is only in view for about eight days. And then it sweeps out of view and it's on the backside of the sun and you lose sight of it. And you never see the whole equatorial region at once. And so you have no ability to really feature track for longer than about eight days. The poles are very, very special. If you can get a high enough view above the surface of the sun, above the poles, if you can get up to a, a very high inclined orbit, then you can actually keep the entire polar region of the sun in your view. And so here is this simulation that I told you earlier was wrong, but could tell us interesting things. And the interesting thing it can tell us is that sweeping giant cells will dance around the pole of the sun for much longer than a single rotation period. And so if you could keep that pole of the sun in your view for a couple of rotation periods, you might be able to average down the surface noise of the supergranules. Those supergranules have lifetimes of about one day. And so if you could watch the pole of the sun for about three months, you'd get about a hundred lifetimes you could average down. Is that enough? We don't know, but you might be able to, you might be able to make some real progress in finding these giant cells by just changing your vantage point. How high do you need to be? Um, to see the whole polar region, you have to be above about 45 degrees north. Um, that's sort of a minimal requirement. Higher is a lot better. Um, the Solaris mission, which is being proposed out of Southwest Research Institute in Swiri, um, is planning to get up to an inclination angle of 75 degrees or more by doing essentially a gravitational assist off of Jupiter. And if that flies, we could have the poles of the sun in view for about three months apiece. And I think if we get that data, we will probably finally see the giant cells and get a real sense of what is the dynamical regime in the interior of the sun. 
Okay. Let's talk about something completely different for a moment, but something that still I think tells us something very important for the sun. Um, and I'll go for about probably seven more minutes here and then we'll, we'll have some questions. Um, one question I would pose for you, I told you that the, the solar community thought for a long time that the tachycline in the sun was the, the seed of the solar dynamo. Um, well, what if you didn't have that? Could you still run a dynamo? Well, it turns out we have some very interesting stars in the universe that have no interior boundary layer, no tachycline. And these are the fully convective M-dwarf stars and their dynamos are very interesting. All right, what's an M-dwarf star from an astronomer's perspective? Well, they're low mass, they're small, they're relatively cool. They're often surprisingly magnetically active. Um, a lot of them are fully convective. Um, they're the most numerous stars in the universe and they're the host stars of most of the planets and possibly most of the habitable planets in our universe. Okay. Um, what's an M-dwarf from the perspective of a fluid dynamicist? Well, um, they're a low Mach number, fully convective object. Um, they've got some non-constant coefficients for their interior, um, but those are pretty easy to get. Um, rather than some like super fancy, complicated to understand MESA model, like the density and variable gravity, I mean, it's basically a polytrope. It's the lane emden solution of a self-gravitating polytrope. Okay, that's, that's easy. Um, uh, you need to know a little bit about the spatially inhomogeneous heating coming from the nuclear generation and the radiative transport um, that we get out of a MESA model. Um, but like their structure is about as dead simple as a stellar structure can be. And there's no difficult convective penetrative overshoot complicated thing at the bottom that we can't see that's like the solar tachycline. Okay, um, so what's, um, what's hard? Um, the hard thing is that you have to be able to correctly simulate a ball that goes all the way through to R equals zero. And that turns out to be mathematically challenging to figure out how to do correctly, but um, kind of surprisingly obvious once you figure it out. Um, and we spent a long time as a group in the Daedalus collaboration studying tensor properties and spheres. We wrote a couple very long papers about that. And then we figured out how to put them in an open source, publicly available framework that we've done science in and that you can all go and use without having to learn all of those tensor properties. Um, and about two years ago, um, using the Daedalus framework, we performed um, what we would say are really the first true global spherical simulations of true fully convective M-dwarfs that go all the way through to the M R equals zero singularity at the center. Um, there's been some star and box simulations and there've been a lot of simulations where people do shells and make the, the, the ball at the middle very, very tiny. But these are the first ones that are really in a sphere and really go all the way through to R zero. They're spectrally accurate. That's got some nice things. They're analastic, they're MHD. Um, we've got flows that we see clearly crossing the center. The flows rising out of the middle are very different than the flows falling from the outer boundary. That's the movie playing at the upper right as an equatorial cross section through these things. All right. Um, the convection inside these things uh, dominates the heat transport. Um, it builds a self-consistent differential rotation, which is shown down here at the right. Um, I've changed my color table on you, but here yellow is fast and blue is slow. So it's the same kind of flavor as the solar differential rotation. The equator goes fast and the poles go slow. Um, and it turns out this builds some really fascinating magnetic fields. And I'll show you those in a moment. Um, in terms of fluid parameters, they're like Rossby number of like 0.3 and they're like Reynolds number of like a hundred or so. So they're still far from stars, but they're at a spot that's kind of interesting. Um, the, these tools, uh, we pushed them out this fall as a, a freely available set of community scripts. They're available at GitHub, BP Brown, D star. Um, and we're continuing development on them right now. But they're, they're there where you can start picking them up and working with them. And the publicly available one took two years to get out because the one we did in testing that led to our publication was just sort of a nightmare of spaghetti code. And we've really cleaned things up to where you can take them and do new experiments with them. The surprising thing we saw in the experiments we did here is that first of all, these um, fully convective M-dwarfs did go and build global scale magnetic fields. 
They just didn't build ones quite like we were expecting. Um, the movie at the bottom shows something like um, uh, the radial magnetic field at our upper boundary. So it's not actually the surface of the star, um, but it's kind of like a proxy for what you might see near the surface of the star. And um, the thing that stands out to me here is there's some some red and blue kind of everywhere, but most of the red and blue is in the Northern Hemisphere. There's not much going on in the Southern Hemisphere, it's mostly yellow. Most of the global scale magnetic field that has been built in this self-consistent rotating dynamo simulation is in the Northern Hemisphere. Okay. Well, this is a movie showing sort of one period of time that the image at the top shows what happens if we look at the average field in longitude, we average it all the way around and we take a slice and we put that down as a, as a vertical strip and then we stamp those out in time. And so we call this a time latitude map. These are of the toroidal magnetic field sort of halfway through the star. And here we also see this super clear signature that all of the saturated color is up in one hemisphere. It's in the Northern hemisphere and not in the Southern hemisphere. Well, except for a while it was in the Southern hemisphere and not in the Northern hemisphere. So there seem to be ways where these things can live only in one hemisphere and they can flip states between hemispheres. Um, the initial conditions um, were actually symmetric in the hemispheres. So it actually had fields in both hemispheres. The dynamical state pushed it into being in one hemisphere or the other. Okay, so the global scale fields of this particular dynamo simulation are like all living just in the Northern hemisphere. That's really weird. Um, they reverse polarity up there. They go through cycles. They do all sorts of like stuff that we like to see for a stellar dynamo. They all do it in one hemisphere. Like it's just absolutely wild. Um, and this, this raises some interesting questions. Um, I mean, I, these aren't ones I can answer at all, um, but it could have real implications for things like M-dwarf habitability. Um, you know, it's possible that if all of your global scale magnetic fields are in one hemisphere, that um, maybe like flares mostly happen in that hemisphere too. That could either be good or bad for plants. I have no idea. Um, the other thing that could be really interesting is um, I was telling the grad students a little bit at lunchtime, uh, there's this like, there's this cool set of work that um, terrestrial plants around Imdorfs might not be habitable because of inductive heating by the Imdorf's magnetic field from the terrestrial planet's orbits dragging them through that magnetic field. Um, a series of papers, um, and I'm forgetting the author who did these, but there's a couple papers that came out a few years ago about this. I think especially about the Trappist planets. Um, a hemispheric set of global scale magnetic fields would have really different effects on the, um, on the hemispheric heating. Um, what those are is a little hard to say. Um, so. It, Understanding the global scale structure of, of an M-dwarf could be the difference between an M-dwarf like on the left, where it's kind of an uninhabitable landscape of flares, or an M-dwarf like on the right, um, where I sent my son to a planet around an M-dwarf, as you can see in the picture there, and there's a nice habitable planet around an M-dwarf. So um, that's actually my son up on our family ranch in San Luis Obispo, um, where we spent a large portion of the pandemic when in August 2020, fires had made our sun look much like an M dwarf. Um, okay, so I'm gonna, I'm gonna hop ahead to a conclusion here. Um, so so um, one, one brief bit of advertisement here. Um, a lot of the work I showed you here was done with the Daedalus uh, pseudospectral toolkit. Um, it's super cool. Um, we did a, a very large methods paper in 2020 that put out a bunch of astrophysically relevant and interesting examples that are openly released that you can build off of and do cool things with. Um, we've spent the last couple of years writing a spherical version of Daedalus that can solve things like the global dynamo problem for, um, for, uh, for stellar uh, M-dwarfs. Um, it turned out the way to do that was to make um, very general ways of representing tensor and vector equations for PDEs. Uh, we have a very large code release for this. It's all publicly visible right now. But we're gonna do a public code release Tuesday of next week. Um, I'm gonna leave you with something funny. Um, when, when we do models of, of astrophysical objects, um, we are really competent at doing simple models. 
And so here is four members of the Daedalus collaboration sailing a very simple boat. Um, I'm steering the boat right now. Um, this, is, uh, this is on the river in between um, MIT it's, and, uh, and, and Boston. Um, it's a protected stretch of river that has bridges at each side that keeps traffic out. There's no wind, there's no waves, and we're sailing back and forth on a dinghy. And we're really good at doing that. We don't flip the dinghy and we don't get wet. Um, not infrequently, when we are thinking about doing um, an astrophysical model, um, including in the Daedalus group, um, we think we can do this. Um, if any of you know about boats, this is a very different class of boat. This is an America's Cup boat. This is one of the most extreme boats that exists. Um, and, and, and in sort of a similar way, we're like, oh, we can totally, we can totally pilot that boat based on our experiences in a dinghy. Um, this boat, by the way, is being piloted by um, the New Zealand all back rugby team. And that crew of just like incredibly physically gifted people is just barely keeping this boat from just destroying itself and flipping over. And sometimes these America Cup boats do um, wreck themselves pretty, pretty spectacularly. Um, and I would argue that this happens in astrophysical simulations sometimes when we try and push our simulation ability beyond our physical understanding of the systems. And the real problem with astrophysical simulations is that our observational constraints can be weak enough that sometimes we don't even know that we've wrecked the boat. And if we're lucky, we see an order one disagreement with the observations and we have to go back and revisit what we've done and try and figure out how to do better. So um, that's, that's why I have to tell you today. Um, I really appreciate the time to come and visit with you all. Um, my, my last parting thoughts are open source codes are really great and all of you should go and build them. Um, don't let things like cost be your primary limiter. Um, if you get a crew of good people together, you can build really good community tools um, just through a lot of collaborative effort. And, uh, and we've done some analysis on some of that. Okay, I have gone past the end of my time. I will stay however long people want to ask questions. And I thank you for your time. Okay, thank you, Ben. So you all know the drill, you can either raise your hand or you can type a question into chat. So it looks like we have a question from Dave. Go ahead, Dave. Uh, yes. Um, in your talk, you focused quite a lot on the fluid motions and to a limited extent on the geometry and time variability of the field. Yeah. The, the thing you didn't talk about um, is the mean amplitude of the field or the power spectrum or dipole yes. versus quadrupole and so forth. And, and I'm wondering to what extent that was just, you had to make some sort of choice and you, you think those things are important anyway, but you just chose not to talk about them or whether you have thoughts on those issues since for many of the astrophysical observations where you have no spatial information of significance, except maybe dipole versus quadrupole, but you do know field strength. Those are the things that you might wish to try and understand. So what, in, in terms of the simulations, how important is it to get, for example, field strength, which some people think is independent of the diffusion coefficients and is just related to heat flow and density and maybe rotation? So I think that that is the like that is the answerable question that simulations can actually answer now. Um, morphology for sure, and maybe amplitude scaling of magnetic fields. Um, I do not think, from my perspective and knowledge of the dynamo simulations that have been done in the field, that our previous simulation work as a community could answer those questions. And the reason for that is that far too often we do like a sweep in something like a rotation parameter. And we think we we're making like a nice cut in parameter space where we could really like compare different simulations to each other to answer something like, how does morphology change with rotation rate? In reality, we do some cut like this. So rather than a nice like orthogonal cut in the parameter space, we'd have some cut that changed multiple parameters simultaneously that all matter in, in my view for the morphology. And so we get answers that are just a mess. We get no clear scalings and we don't like, we just don't understand anything. Um, 
I think we've really learned the control parameters for these experiments where we can actually do the cuts that start exposing the physics. And that's been a very new thing in basically the last two years. Um, so I think, like, I think that that is actually the lowest hanging fruit that simulations could try and answer. If you do a suite of simulations that you think are all at the same level of like turbulence, Reynolds number 100 or so, but different Rossby numbers in a controlled way, um, do you get a like systematic change in the morphology? Can you turn behavior on and off? Can you do some of those things? So, yeah. Okay. Okay, Catherine. I was wondering in the simulations where there was a large scale field in just one hemisphere of an M dwarf, yeah. you mentioned <laughs> that the the field would move to the other hemisphere, but it would also flip polarity. Which which happened faster? Like, would it flip within one hemisphere and then later move? Yes. Yeah. So it um it flips polarity fast. It changes hemispheres slow. So the the picture at the top here um, shows. Uh, a long history of a simulation from left to right in that, that image at the top. And uh, actually, let me go to the movie even better. Um, so here we've got that same image at the top here. We've got the movie. The movie spans like this green box here for like time scale comparison. So the, the, the polarity changes happen in a single hemisphere and happen fast. The flips have a long time scale and um, we don't we don't actually know what triggers the flips. Um, they may they may be like a large enough critical amplitude kick kind of thing or some sort of like avalanche theory kind of thing because like it stayed in one for a while and then jumped through there. So here we had one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine flips in one hemisphere, and then it jumped hemispheres. Um, what is what is the time axis in like years or? Yeah, so this is this is the time scale being shown here has to do with the rotation period of the star. Um, I, uh, the unit, the actual units here, um, uh, I'd have to I'd have to do a conversion that I'm not going to try and do right now. One is not one rotation period. Probably about ten is a rotation period, somewhere around there. Um, and I can I can check that more carefully when I'm not doing it on the fly right now. Um, uh, for an M dwarf to be in a Rossby number of like 0.3 regime like this M dwarf, um, the rotation period is probably like 100 days. So a year is looking like maybe 30 of these time units, for example. Um, so like this particular star probably is doing a cycle period of kind of like a decade and it's spending like a century in one hemisphere and then it's like flipped and then it's spending like a thousand years or a couple of centuries in the other hemisphere. Um, for this one, we didn't run it long enough to see if it comes back. We've had ones that start in the north and come to the south. We've had ones that start in the south and come to the north. Um, we don't understand any of that. Um, uh, the other interesting, we've tried really hard to make these go away. Um, so we've done things like simplify this down to a boost and S system. So like, Get rid of the stratification, get rid of the like stellar heat profile and all those other things, make it as simple as you can. And we see much of the same phenomenon. Um, so I think there's some, there's some simple enough experiments where we could actually figure out the physics here, um, but we don't know them yet, so. Thanks. We invite people who want to figure out physics like these to come and do some of these experiments. <laughs> we have the okay. tools, so we lack the person power. Sterl. <clears throat> yeah, so, so you started off with the plot of um, the uh, amplitude of differential rotation as a function of Rossby number, and you've quoted lots of Rossby numbers, but obviously the Rossby number depends on radius and their sort of right. global definitions and local definitions. And if you run cylinders, there's even, it's not mixing length. So how yep. exactly are you defining Rossby number in these? And yeah. In simulations, it's easy in some senses because we have all the data. So what we're measuring here is we're measuring, so, the, so this is all simulation data. And um, the, the x-axis on the bottom, um, one really good dynamical measure inside a simulation we found of rotational constraint. And like we've, we've checked this carefully and like done some work that really 
really shows this is the right dynamical measure is to measure the vorticity of the, mo of the fluid motion and compare it to the planetary vorticity of the rotating frame. So calculate curl of U, um, compare it to two omega, the term in the Coriolis force, and you know, do something like, so this is just like a volume average. Volume averages turn out to be really good for that, actually, even in stratified domains. Like you don't have to do fancy density weighting or other stuff like that. So calculate your volume average vorticity. Uh, we do it by calculating the entropy, which is the scalar dot product of vorticity with itself. Um, so you have a nice scalar quantity, you volume average that up in the domain of a simulation, and you compare the, um, the entropy, which is the vorticity squared, to, um, to the two omega squared, square root the whole thing to get your Rossby number. Um, we, we've done some interesting experiments that shows that that has like some cool dynamical implications and probably also like picks out like a, a kind of correct dynamical scale. Um, how do you go figure it out for like a star that you're looking at or another like physical system? Um, that gets a lot harder. Um, I think that there, so like this, this work I talked about by, uh, by Jeff Vassell and Keith Julian and Nick Featherstone, like I think they've done a good crack at it for the sun um, of trying to like incorporate those kinds of ideas and go and like figure out what the implications would be within like a solar structure model. Um, I talked with Jen Van Saders from Hawaii a bunch when I was at Santa Barbara and she was super keen to try and do this for other stars. Um, so maybe we start seeing that in some other stellar structure models based on MESA down the road. Um, but it's, it's something where like, I think some careful theory thinking could bring some new insights from rotating convection. Um, John Arnaud at UCLA, who's just down the road from you all, has also done some really fascinating work on this and would be a, a very good person to have come talk at some point if you haven't had him. All right, Sri. Um, yeah, I had a basic question and uh, sort of a, you know, interesting idea for a space mission. So the basic question is, if I take a flat, you know, uh, pot, uh, fairly large, let's say maybe 10 inch or 12 inch diameter and boil water, which you have to do for pasta, mm -hmm. I don't see the effect that you claim where the height, the size of my bubbling things have to be equal to the height of the water. Yeah. I see a whole scale of things, but nothing as large as that. Shri, Shri, you're confusing the phase change for the uh, convective flow. Well, I know, but I have to use some measure. I mean, you know, <laughs> I, I can't, I'm not sticking in any thermometer there, but yeah. I'm, okay. So, so the flow you'd actually have to look at is before the pot starts to boil, right? And it's the, it's the, um, it's the, it will end up probably being a pot scale flow that's happening. Um, or don't fill your pot all the way. And then, so, so you can actually do this with cooking oil. If you're very careful in the kitchen, um, you can get hexagonal patterns of convection in a pan of cooking oil in the kitchen. Um, and if you're super careful, you can actually see like critical Rayleigh onset by tipping the pan. So parts of it are deeper and parts of it are shallower. And so parts of it convect and parts of it don't. Okay, okay fair and enough. What do you said to the bubble? So next time I'll put some paprika powder because that will be a little tracer before yes. I'll get my bubbles and then I'll yes. report back to you. I just Perfect. wonder whether, you know, it just has that smell where yeah. astronomers are like, oh yeah, it's one lens scale. You know, it's one of these things. It's easy. It's a usual theory thing to do. You know, I mean, simplicity and all that. And usually they're wrong. That's why I was like, okay, the novel suggestions are following. We don't know what's happening on the other side of the sun. Okay. No. So, <laughs> yeah. So uh, both for practical reasons, of course, you know, I mean, it's like a, it's a thing to get funding really, uh, but also for fun reasons uh, to get a full 24, uh, full orbital coverage at any given time. Yes. Why not consider a mission that goes to the L3 point, not L1, but L3 point. I, there's some technical complications. We put in a trailing orbit, that's easy. And, you know, it may take a while. It may take over three decades, but, you know, it's doing stuff on its cruise phase. And then we go and park it in L3. Then we have a complete coverage of the sun, which is orthogonal to the polar mission that you talked about. 
I would love that. In fact, build me three SDOs. They're cheap. I think SDO is about a billion dollars and we're building three of them, right? We should be able to like get that cost down some. And like, I mean, we just spent $10 billion launching an infrared telescope and that like, that's very impressive. But for like a third of that cost, we could have three SDOs giving full phase coverage on the sun. Right. Well, you could also contact the L4 and L5 societies for some, um, you know, donation uh, in case you didn't know what those societies are. So we did, we did one experiment in solar physics. The, um, what were they called? Were they called this, not the Sentinels, uh, stereo, stereo, because they gave a stereoscopic vision of the sun. Stereo A and B were launched in trailing and leading orbits to the earth and um, have done a couple of sweeps of the sun. And there've been some times where we've had full coverage. The big problem with them is that they only they have the wrong instruments because they don't have helioseismic imagers. Um, and that costs you a more substantial satellite than, uh, than otherwise. So. By the way, I enjoyed your talk. Thank you very much. Thank you, Sri. Okay. Yes, and I enjoyed it as well. Thank you so much, Ben. We're well out over time now, so I think we'll end it there. Let's thank Ben again. Thank you. I'll see some of you tomorrow. And as I was saying to Jim, um, I might come see some of you this summer um, since I will be back in San Luis Obispo with my family on the ranch. So, and I will hang out if anyone else wants to visit for a few more minutes, but also get on with your dinners. <laughs> and you as well, we, we watched it get dark behind you as you were talking. It has, it has gotten dark behind me, so. <laughs> I was a um, lot of fun. I, I may not see you tomorrow. Um, can I ask another question? Of course. Um, you talked briefly about the possible role of diffusion coefficients. And, and of course, yeah. I, I know that dynamos, you're always many orders of magnitude away from the correct values. But then the question arises,